this time of Lent, we're talking about hope. What it means to be hopeful and, and how maybe just some of us need to reclaim the hope, the promises of Christ and what, what Easter is all about in our daily lives. And so as we continue to do that today, um, did you guys know that recently when we were away that we were, does everybody know that my uh, family and I went to Disney World? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of you did, some of you didn't. What's that? Yes, I, well, I will tell you that when you, get, when you get on a plane and it's 75, when you get off a plane and it's 25, it's not, it's like getting smacked in the face coming back, coming back to Pennsylvania. But it was a great, yeah. Yeah, everybody feels bad for me. Yeah, it's like, it's good. Yeah, keep it up. I feel terrible. Can, can you, can you? <laughs> okay, so, but, you know, the thing was it, was, it was so much fun. It was so much fun because we have two girls, Madeline and Lydia, and, and uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would have asked for girls. In fact, uh, I probably would have wanted boys, but I love having little girls, and my life is purple, pink, and glitter, and, uh, you know, I've just embraced it and it the way it is. And the, thing that's, the thing that was so cool about Disney World was that, um, when you're there with your kids, you know, it's it's entirely from beginning to end meant to bring you into this other world. You know, and it's it's like a fantasy land. And you know how every you know fantasy or every fairy tale ends. And it ends with these words happily ever after. Right? And they all lived happily ever after. I mean, I read this to my kids in stories, and they all live happily ever after. It paints this picture that, that uh, you know, life is going to be, you know, this prince that's going to charge it, and everyone's going to live happily ever after. And it's even really, it's just so easy to get caught up. And at one point, we were at Disney World, and uh, there was like a play up on the <coughs> Kingdom Steps, and I'm holding Madeline, and I'm just watching the wonder in her eyes, you know, about this, and and, and I, I got a little choked up, which won't surprise most of you. And uh, and I was just was I was just like you know, honestly, as a dad, um, I, I I was choked up because I did I looked at her face, and it wasn't because of what they were doing on the stage. It was because I didn't want her to ever face what reality is. I didn't want her to. I I, I don't want to see that moment or that day when she realizes that. Really, not everything ends with happily ever after. That innocence of a five-year-old is something that, you know, can I just be honest, I, I wish I could keep forever. You know, if, in my worst days, it's that, that impulse that I have to, like, surround her with a bubble and never let her see or talk to anybody or see anything in the real world. Because for me, um, I know it's true that life, life isn't happily ever after. It's not, it isn't all the time. I mean, there are seasons, but life isn't happily ever after. For some of you, for some of you, that's one of the things that struggled. You've struggled with faith in the past. You've struggled with hope in the past. Is that you've come face to face with the reality life isn't happily ever after. Some of you, you're here this morning, but your faith in Christ, and, and you, if you were honest with me, sometimes wavers. And maybe it is right now because. You had a Sunday school faith where well-meaning Sunday school teachers and well-meaning pastors said, you know, God loves you and, and He has a plan for you. And then you grew up and the faith that you were taught in Sunday school didn't match up to the real world. And you thought, man, if you're a good father, what is this? What's going on? And you struggled with that. Some of you, you faced trials and you faced, you know, deaths of close people and you and you faced hardships and losing jobs and people turning their backs on you and you face all of the things that happen in a sinful world and you realize you know what it's not all happily ever after and through those seasons and times you've fallen away from having hope and fallen into something else that we've talked about over these weeks despair Despair, very simply, is just the absence, the complete loss or absence of hope. That the unhappily ever afterness of this world can lead you to the place where you lose hope completely. And maybe, maybe it's just so. Maybe it's not where you would say to me, I've lost all hope. 
but it's just subtle things in your life. The subtleness is, can take the form of depression. And you, you feel depressed and you've had seasons of depression. Or, or maybe it's just fleeing. It's fleeing. You flee a situation or you just want to go into your room and shut the door and curl up in your bed and wake up 20 years from now. Ever been there? I have. It can take the form of medicating. Medicating with alcohol, with drugs. It can take the form of medicating with food. Take the form of medicating with this next list, distraction. When I've lost hope, I often, this is me, this is, this is your pastor right here. I can binge on Netflix with the best of them. If I'm in a place where I don't feel like dealing with the reality of the world, just disappear for five hours. And it's so easy, it's just the next one comes right back on, right? You know? But that's where you can be. And it's, it, you don't even realize that it's the place you may be in here. Your heart may be slipping into despair. Some of us fall into our work. We can't deal with the real world. We can't deal with the problems. But you know what? I know how to do this. And I'm good at it. So I'm going to do it 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours. Because at least I know how to do this. Some of us, it's spending. We, we spend. And, and that, that uptick in our hearts and that excitement we get of something new really just seems to mask the despair. Some of us, it's avoidance. If I just pretend it's not real, it's not. And most of us that choose avoidance know that it never goes away. <coughs> Some of us, it's resentment. You're in despair. You've lost hope because of relationships and your heart is filled with resentment. Maybe you're resentment toward God. You think He's punishing you. Maybe resentment towards others. Because what they did how they did it, the fact that they're still the way they are, it's caused you to despair. Some of us, we deny that we're even in despair. I find that so often when people are like, I'm okay. But I can see in their eyes that It's normal for us to lose hope. It's normal for us to sometimes have despair, but we have to ask the question, how do we cope with the loss of hope? How do we do that? How do we as believers cope with the loss of hope? How does losing hope and, and the hope that we have in Christ come face to face? All of us get to a place at one point or another where we say these words, I just can't do it anymore. I hope that I'm not the only one that's been there. So how do we cope with the loss of hope? How do we reclaim hope today? One of the ways that I have found such, such uh, joy or such truth in the, in the Bible, and to, in God's Word, with this idea of coping with the loss of hope is looking at the lives of the people that are in the Bible. And one of them is this guy named Paul. Do you know Paul? Yeah? <coughs> Paul's a good one. I mean, Paul was this guy who had, kind of had it all. He was a... Pharisee of Pharisees, he was a teacher of the law, and, and he didn't follow the pre-resurrected Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus when he was on earth. He, in fact, uh, Paul, if you, if you don't like Christians, you might actually like Paul, because he persecuted them for a while after Christ went to heaven, and, and he actually got permission to be one of the guys that persecuted and threw him in jail, and, and he was actually a pretty bad dude. And then he met Jesus the post-resurrected Jesus on this road to Damascus. And Jesus blinded him and Jesus changed his life forever. And who was the greatest enemy of the movement of the church became the biggest champion. In fact, two-thirds of our New Testament are letters from the Apostle Paul. And we know that the Apostle Paul planted churches and he raised up leaders. And what was a small sect of Judaism became this unstoppable force for the kingdom of God that is the reason why a man who was a Jew almost 2,000 years ago in the other part of the country, had, uh, the other part of the world, has ended with all of us gathered together. He played a big part in God's story. But you know what? When you look at somebody like that, and you look at a guy like Paul, you must think, man, he really had a lot of faith. But guess what? Paul, probably more than any of us, had reason to despair. For those of us that believe the lie that being a Jesus follower means a life without problems, a life of happily ever after, 
All we have to do is look at the life of Paul. One of the places where we see this really clearly is 2 Corinthians. It's a letter he wrote to a church in Corinth where he talks about some of his reasons to despair. If you want to turn there with, with me this morning, you're welcome to. It's 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul's sharing with the people that he's talking to in this church in Corinth through this letter that he wrote them about the reason he has to despair, about what he's faced being a Christ follower, being someone who's on fire for the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, he talks about what has happened through his life. At the hands of people who were his friends, at the hands of people that were the same race as him, as Jews. He says this, he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. With the cat of nine tails, this, this piece of, this, this whip that had little strands of leather and inside the leather was, was bone and and rock, and it would be stranded in there, so that when it was whipped against your back, it would catch in your skin, and then they would pull it away. And in the law, the Jewish law, they said that if you whipped somebody 40 times, and they died, that you weren't guilty of murder. It was in the Jewish law. You could whip somebody up to 40 times, and if they died, as long as it was 40 or under, you weren't guilty of murder. So what the Jews did to Paul was they whipped him 39 times just to make sure they didn't lose count. Yeah, that's the truth. And he says five times that happened to him because he was following Jesus. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he says, yeah, I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. Most of us have a hard time imagining spending a day or a night without power in our house. And Paul says, I spent a day and a night in the open sea. Listen to his life. A man sold out for Jesus. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. Gosh, where could you go, Paul, that you didn't feel despair? I've labored and toiled, and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. Goodness, I miss lunch and I'm hangry. You know? I've been cold and naked. And yet I was faithful. And yet, in that despair, I had hope. Tell me, what, what, would, what would happen in a man, in a person, in a Jesus follower, that they could do this, and yet 2,000 years later almost, we could pick up this word and hear such, such words of hope. We could pick up this, this, this word and, and turn to letters to the Romans and, and learn about the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. I mean, how could it possibly a person who has that much despair for following Jesus possibly be able to carry through the power with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can reach so many people with the love of God. It's because he not only faced this, but he personally faced something so much more. Just a few a few chapters or a few verses later in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul shares something that he dealt with after meeting Jesus, after following Jesus. Some of you are some of you are uh, familiar with this. Paul said, because I was working for Jesus, because I was following Him, because God was using me, and I was, I, he says, I even had a vision where I saw heaven, and I was led in on these things that most people never, ever see. And because I was seeing miracles, and, and God was doing miracles through me, something happened. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a form in my flesh. A messenger of Satan. It's a torment. Paul says, I was given. You know, the Greek word there, because the New Testament was actually written originally in Greek, the Greek word for given has the same idea as me giving you a Christmas present. It wasn't, it wasn't that I, I had this, this problem. Paul says, I was given a thorn in my flesh. I think about, you know, like... Um, the Princess Bride, where the guy's like, I don't think that means what you think it means. You know, I want to say that to Paul. Like, I'm not sure you're using the right word there. He says, no, I was given a thorn in my flesh. And this thorn, we don't know what it is. 
<laughs> Some people think it's epilepsy. Some people think that Paul had epilepsy and that he would be serving and then he would go into seizures and wake up and be like, what happened? And that would be something that happened in his ministry. Some people believe that we know that Paul had problems with his eyesight. And some people believe because he was beaten so bad at times that he suffered with headaches and he suffered with blindness. And, and it was because of what we just read earlier about what he dealt with. Some people think it was just depression. And, and goodness, I mean, if we look at what he dealt with for Christ, maybe he did battle off and on with depression. Some people thought maybe that it's uh, malaria. Paul traveled all over the world. And they thought maybe he just had malaria and he couldn't, he couldn't kick it. But this is what we know, that Paul had something that he felt that was uh, a hindrance to his life. It was something that kept coming up over and over and over again. Something that drove him to despair. And he called it a messenger of Satan that tormented him. That literally beat him up on a daily basis. You know, messenger of Satan, we don't really know what that means. I mean, I think we use that sometimes when we say something hurt like the devil, and I don't even know what that means. But, you know, that's what he said. And look what Paul did. This is important. Stay with me. This, look what Paul did facing this. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Folks, what drives you to despair? Do you plead with the Lord sometimes? Now, this isn't like Paul, for three days in a row, prayed. Lord, I wish you'd take away this. And then after three days, like, I guess God's not going to answer my prayers. I'll just, you know, give up. No. What the, the idea is, is Paul probably spent three seasons of his life fasting in deep prayer, calling out to God, saying, take this away from me. I can't do it. Until the day that God answered his prayer. But not the way he wanted to hear it. Paul said, but he... Christ said to me, and if you're looking in your Bible, this is in red. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. My grace, my love, my, my, my un, unearned love for you, my work of my spirit in your heart and life... It is sufficient. It's all you need. For my power, the power of the same power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you is made perfect. It's made complete. You are fully what I want you to be in the moment that you are the weakest. Paul, I understand your pleading. I understand that you're fasting. I understand that this is something that hurts like the devil. It beats you up. And it, you feel like it's a hindrance. But for me, as, as your Lord and Savior, I want you to understand that in the moments of despair, in the moments when you have no hope, that my grace and my love is sufficient because it's in the moment in your weakest possible place is when I am the strongest and you are complete in your weakness and despair. And my power is forced in that moment. Paul says this. Therefore, my dad used to say, if there's a therefore, you have to check and see what it's there for. <laughs> therefore, because I know that it's in my weakest moments that Christ is strongest, I will boast. I will have joy. I will glorify God all the more gladly about my weakness, about my despair, so that Christ's power may rest on me. So how do we cope with the loss of hope? How do we deal with despair? Paul says we embrace it. Paul says that if you want to have a vision of what Christ wants to do in the reality that life is not happily ever after is you embrace it because it's only when, church, you embrace it and you embrace your inability to face it that you'll experience Christ in it. It's only when you embrace your inability that you'll experience His ability at work in you. It's completely opposite of what we think, isn't it? It's completely opposite of what drives us to cope, and what drives us to medicate, what drives us to, to flee. No, it says we step in it because we believe at the moment that we're at the end of our rope, that is when Christ is shining the, the brightest through us. And for Paul, for Paul who pleaded that God would take away this thorn, 
he was used mightily because he boasted, he glorified God. In another letter that he wrote to a church in Romans, he says the exact same thing. He says, we glory in our sufferings. That's the same word as boast, just translated differently. We glory in our sufferings. We give God praise in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces what? Hope. That word perseverance is the Greek word hypomena. I love that word. Hypo is where we get hypodermic needle. Literally just means under. And, men and meno means the weight. I don't think it's I don't think it's by accident that Christ said following him means to be taking up the weight of the cross of David. <clears throat> and that perseverance is remaining under the weight. Because it's when we're under the weight of this world, we recognize, as I shared earlier about confession, our inability to do it. And if we stay there, if we stay in a place where we feel like we're unable to do it, we'll never experience the power of Christ and His ability to work through it. How do we cope with hope? First of all, we've got to be honest with God. Be honest with God. Paul said, I pleaded three times. I will tell you, in my own life, when I was, when I was in my darkest place, the greatest thing that somebody said to me when I was struggling with the death of my mom was they said, Dan, have you cried out to God? Have you shaken your fist at Him? Have you said, I don't understand this. It hurts so bad. And I thought, you know what? No, because if I do that, he's going to like strike me dead or something, you know? <laughs> and, and then the person was like, the person was my dad. He's like, hello, have you read David in the Psalms? No, cry out to God. <clears throat> Pour out your heart to him. Say, God, I can't deal with this. Be willing to do that. If you're in a place where you've lost your hope today, God can take it. Cry out to him. Plead with him. I don't believe that every time he's not going to answer prayer. It just may not be the way that we, we see it. But he will answer it. But cry out to him. Plead with him. Say, take this moment of despair away. But also, if you don't get the answer you want, I would encourage you to trust in his promises. And his purposes. That's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. And one of the ways that I find it's easy to do this is to do something that I would call reverse engineering. It's to look back. You know how I trust in God's working His redemptive promises as I look back. See, for me, I'm a journaler. I don't know if any of you are. I journal when I write Scripture, and, or when I read Scripture and God's speaking to me. But however it works for you, I encourage you, if you need to trust in His redemptive purposes, to look back. Reverse engineer your life. Look back at those moments. Okay, well, three years ago, I was in this place, and look where I'm at now. And four years before that, I remember this season of life that I thought was the most despair I could handle. And look where I'm at. Look where God took me through that. Look how God used that. Sometimes, for me, it's just easier to see God at work after than it is in the middle. Anybody else? So I would encourage you to do that. If you're in a place today where you've lost hope, where you need to cope with hope, look back. And if you look back and you're like, but Dan, I don't see God working. I just see destruction. I may see despair. I see all the things. You're here right now. Maybe God is trying to write a new story in this very moment. But also, trusting in His redemptive purposes means looking forward. Looking to His promises. Looking to the reality that at the moment of your greatest weakness, at the moment when you've lost all hope, in the moment where despair is the only thing you can see, in the moment where you're at the end of your rope, and you can no longer cope with hope, that's the place where if you embrace your inability, you will experience Christ's ability that work through you. Because like Paul said, and like Jesus said to him, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Church, we weren't made to do this alone. It's very clear in the whole, the whole narrative of this book is that our brokenness and our 
our disobedience messed things up. But it's also evident that our good Father, He immediately went to action. And what He calls each of us to do is realize that we are not able to do it alone. And when we're sitting in despair, it's a really good chance that that's what we're trying to do. But His Spirit wants to pull you out of that place to the place where He can glorify Himself through you. And that will give you a message to share to the world that so needs to hear. Because people aren't used to hearing but there is hope. And people are often coping with hope with that list we saw earlier. And God may want to use you just like He used the Apostle Paul to say, you know what, at your weakest moment, at the end of your road, that's where Jesus actually begins to work. And His power is perfect in our weakness. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, teach us how to live in our weakness. Teach us how to, how to see you in our despair so that we may learn to depend on Jesus. That our hope is built on nothing less than Him. Father, for those who are coping with the loss of hope this morning, remind us that it's in our weakness that Christ's strength, Christ's ability, Christ's power is on display. Let that truth take a hold of us this morning. So that when we leave this place into a world that doesn't see hope, that they would find it in us. We point them to the source. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for our time here. Be with each person as they leave this morning. Keep them safe as they go into the work week this week and the school week this week, wherever you take them. Give us an opportunity to share the hope that is in us. In Jesus' name. <coughs>